Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning into the Planet in Focus industry events. I'm Alessandra Canito, Programs Director at Planet in Focus International Environmental Film Festival, and welcome to our 22nd festival edition taking place from October 14th to the 24th. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the participants today, along with the Planet in Focus organization, are situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Huron Wendat, and in more recent times, the Haudenosaunee, Metis, and Inuit people who have been living on this land for thousands of years. For us, this recognition of the contributions and importance of Indigenous peoples, their history and guidance, are connected to our commitment to the environment, its people, and this treasured meeting place. On today's panel, we'll be meeting with James Luscombe with Telephone Canada, Leslie Burchard at CBC Docs, Jill Sampson at CMFPA Telefilm, and our very own senior programmer, Julian Carrington, who will be representing the Hot Docs Fund today. Today's panel will be hosted by award-winning filmmaker and dear friend of the festival, Liz Marshall, whose films Meet the Future, Midian Farm, The Ghosts in Our Machine, and Water on the Table have screened at Planet in Focus over the last decade. Finally, thank you so much to our government funders and sponsors for their support of the festival and industry events, including the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Arts Council, the Government of Ontario, Ontario Creates, Heritage Canada, Telefilm Canada, and industry sponsors IATSE 873 and Dynamic Solutions. And now let's meet the funders. Filmmakers, remember to put your questions in the chat and take it away, Liz. Good morning, good afternoon uh, from the West Coast of Canada. And um, this is lovely, good to be here. Thank you, Planet and Focus. One of my absolutely favorite film festivals in the whole wide world. And so it's, it's uh, good to, to be here with some of the leaders in our industry to ask some really important questions for the emerging and, and mid-career filmmakers that are in attendance today. And we will allot some time for Q&A so you can use the chat function. Let's begin with you, Jill. Can you talk to us, um, what is CMF? Can you unpack what it means? It's a very specific sure. kind of Canadian funding model thing. And you know, sometimes emerging filmmakers, sometimes mid-career filmmakers don't always understand you know, what is a, um, uh, the license and how it triggers the CMF. Can you talk to us sure. about that and how it's sure. an essential part of the funding pie? Uh, I'll also sort of clarify why I work at Telefilm, but work for the CMF. <laughs> so uh, uh, we have a group of um, about 60 employees at Telefilm who um, just work on the Canada Media Fund programs. So that is what we call <clears throat> convergent programs, which was, you know, anything that is, you know, sort of TV based. And we have experimental, which is um, gaming and software. So we... Um, the CMF uh, writes the policy, works with Heritage. We administer all of their programs. So you would apply to Telefilm and, and, and talk to all of our analysts. The Canada Media Fund um, this year had an operating budget. I think it was 364 million, um, so, which is great. We, um, most of our programming, uh, not the experimental, but most of the convergent programming is um, broadcaster based. So you do have to work with a broadcaster um, to gain the majority of the funds. Um, and um, we offer everything from pre-development, which is, you know, help writing a pitch document to pitch a broadcaster, development money, um, all the way production to, to production money. Lots of different programs. I think we, at last count, we had like over 40. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for documentary filmmakers to um, to access uh, funding with us and in other languages too. We have indigenous um, funding. We have uh, a new fund for racialized, um, the racialized communities. We have a diverse language program where you can do a documentary in any language that you want, Farsi, Urdu, whatever. So lots of different funding opportunities with us. Oh, you're on mute. How would you, so, what what do you say then to an emerging filmmaker that they need to have a broadcast license before they're able to access uh, the funds? I would say for, I mean, 
definitely go to the CMF website, which is cmf-fmc.ca and check out all the programs. Um, for pre-development, which is the pitch, you don't need to have a broadcaster give you any money. You do need a letter of interest from a broadcaster, which generally isn't that difficult to find. Um, there's a list in the guidelines on who we consider a, an eligible broadcaster. Um, but depending where you are in the country, even some regional broadcasters will work. Um, and you can always call us. There is a 1-800 number and you can call us anytime to talk about um, uh, about any of the programs. But I would start on the website and take a look at all the different programs and see what is a good fit. Um, for emerging, um, you know, if you are interested in, you know, production, um, we have a lot of different selective funds. We have a POV documentary fund, um, but, and you don't have to have a broadcaster to apply to that fund, but if your project is successful and chosen, we won't contract you until you find a broadcaster. So they, the, most of these programs are broadcaster linked. Thanks, that's clear. Uh, over to you, Leslie. Um, so at CBC, there's a number of, um, you know, shorts and features and things that you commission. Uh, can you talk to us about, give us an idea of all that you're involved in? Yes, it's a lot. Uh, so yeah, I work in the CBC unscripted department, which uh, includes factual entertainment and arts and CBC Life and CBC Docs. Um, within CBC Docs, we have The Nature of Things, we've got The Passionate Eye, Short Docs, which I primarily oversee. Um, we're the majority owner of the Documentary Channel, which are primarily feature length docs. Um, we also commission maybe two to three doc series per year. Um, an example would be Enslaved with Samuel Jackson. We also uh, recently announced um, uh, a series about Black history in Canada called Black Life um, by uh, showrunner Leslie Norville. And uh, then occasional specials that don't fit into some of those spaces. Um, but yeah, lots of different opportunities. And in particular, as I mentioned, um, I oversee the short doc strand and that is very much geared to working with um, more emerging um, documentary filmmakers and it's always hard to kind of quantify what does emerging mean and in my mind that's someone who probably hasn't worked with a big broadcaster before and could use a little bit more of our time kind of walking you through that process like what does a production executive like me do what's my job and how are we going to work with you and how do you navigate the whole awful business and right side of things if you're mainly focused on creative so we really try to um, work with and mentor filmmakers through that process with an eye to working with them more um, in different ways uh, as CBC and, and, and of course, you know, giving them, um, uh, you know, some calling cards to work with other broadcasters as well. But yeah, we've, we've had, um, you know, some really great success with Docs like Sing Me a Lullaby by Tiffany Shung that just uh, won the Canadian Screen Award last year. Take Me to Prom by Andrew Moyer. Fast Horse by Alex Lazarevich. Uh, Inandi by Serene Fox this past year. Um, the list goes on. So lots of great opportunities for, for new and emerging filmmakers within short docs. But I would also just like to mention too, you know, all those other strands, we're always wanting to widen the pool of people we're working with. Um, I specifically want to mention Nature of Things, which I oversee some episodes of that as well, because we're really eager to work with, um, you know, some new, new interesting voices in, um, in the science and nature space. And certainly that taps into the environmental uh, themes that the audience here today would be so passionate about. How, for example, would someone who's interested in, you know, directing or producing a Nature of Things episode, how do they go about making that a reality? Mm -hmm. So the best first thing to do would be to take a look at our independent producers page. And uh, I've just put that in the chat, a link to that in the chat. And I would say with, when you're pitching for any, uh, to any part of CBC, it's really great to take a look at that first, just to get a sense of, 
what kind of stuff are we doing? Um, you might be able to already see that something's in production that's kind of similar to the idea you're about to pitch, or you also might go, oh yeah, it doesn't really look like my idea fits within what they're looking for right now. So I would always say, take a look at that first, specifically take a look at nature of things. There's some really great examples there of um, docs that have really resonated with our audience, uh, in audience as well in the past few years. Um, and I mean, I think for anybody pitching these days, it's just so great that you can usually um, see that content online and, and even just kind of scan through it. You know, you can't watch every nature of things from the past 61 seasons, <laughs> but you can certainly scan through what we've done in the last couple of years on CBC Gem to, to get a sense of what is working and what's resonating with audiences. But then it's as simple as reaching out to us um, through that portal that I that I've shared um, and um, starting a conversation. You don't have to have all the answers. It can just be the germ of an idea. Um, you may not know that you're the person to produce this on your own, but we're, I would say you don't have to have that all sorted out. We just want to talk about the idea first and foremost, first and foremost, and then we can talk with you about, you know, is this something you can produce on your own or do you maybe need to connect up with another production company? That's helpful. And then with the with the short um, documentary strand, um, is that like a one stop shop? Can you explain the funding model for that? So those work on an independent production model as with with all of those other docs that I've been talking about. So you um, pitch us an idea. If we like it, uh, we'll ask for a budget, a production budget. Um, and depending on how much it costs, we may fund the whole thing. We, we do for quite a few of them um, because we're commissioning a lot of them. Like I commission about 25 a year and we're looking for content that we can get up on CBC Gem, on the CBC Docs YouTube channel. Some of the stories are very timely. I've got one coming out next week about a young woman um, who has just fled Kabul in Afghanistan and you know, we want that story up. So that's the beauty of the digital space is being able to have a bit of that flexibility. Um, but yeah, you, as, as the producers, you're responsible for hiring the team, for producing the content, working with someone like me who will help guide you through that process. But, um, but it'll be up to you to kind of figure out how that money is spent. There isn't one set uh, amount that we pay. It really depends. There's there's a really wide range of budgets depending on is there travel like there was in Sing Me a Lullaby. They had to go to Taiwan. You know, is there animation? Um, is it something that's being shot over the course of a year versus like two days? <laughs> so, um, so we kind of, you know, walk you through some of those steps again, if we feel that maybe you'd be better to be paired with somebody else who can complement your skill sets. We'll talk to you about that. But in the end, um, you're responsible for producing it and we will um, pay for it or help you find, you know, may direct you towards some other funding opportunities. Um, if it is, especially if it's something that's a little bit more expensive or if we're at a time of year when we're running out of our own money. Um, and then you own the content, we just license it back from you uh, for a period of time. Great, <clears throat> that's helpful. And just before we move on to James, could you just explain what is that budget range that you were referencing there? I mean, it's very wide, <laughs> but I mean, I we've probably done some in the maybe fifteen to twenty thousand dollar range up to over a hundred thousand. Probably the average of from the short doc strand is fifty or sixty thousand total. Um, but yeah, it, it depends on so many different things in terms of what that project is. Okay, great. Thanks, Leslie. Hi, James. So uh, let's talk about fiction um, and what you do. So um, thanks, Liz. Uh, so uh, I, I work at Telefilm on the feature film department. Um, 
and uh, yes, we're we're primarily a, a, a funder of you know the uh, development, production, promotion of, of feature films. That includes documentaries, um, and uh, I'm on the content side, uh, looking at the creative or the proposals, um, involved in the decision making, um, and I think relevant to to th this panel today. Um, I can talk about a few of the programs where, where documentary filmmakers can access our money and where we can be a piece of the puzzle. Um, first of all, we've got a development program, um, which includes uh, feature films, narrative feature films and documentaries that you can apply for. Uh, that actually, our, our development program, just we just had an intake uh, that, that closed September uh, 15th. But uh, there's, there are different streams in there. There's a pre-qualified stream for uh, producers who have a track record and have some theatrical uh, success behind them. There's a selective stream for if you've released something in the last six years. Um, there's an indigenous stream and a stream for black and people of color. So all of these development streams um, they have slightly different eligibility requirements, but um, you can look them up and, and, and see how it's accessible. It's usually based on the last six years of uh, a track record. And in some cases, that's very flexible in terms of have, have you released uh, you know, a, a, a narrative feature uh, digitally or have you released a short or have a, a TV project. Um, so that development, uh, funding up to $25,000. Um, and that includes documentaries. Um, it is a repayable loan, repayable first day of principal photography. I always say that because on low budget projects, you can have the $25,000 development loan, and then, then regret it on the first day of <laughs> principal photography when you got to pay it back. Um, so that's available. For emerging filmmakers, we have the Talent to Watch program which uh, provides the new guidelines just went up. And this program is gonna be opening up next spring uh, for, for intake. And uh, it, it allows you to come in uh, for a micro budget, uh, uh, either documentary or narrative feature. On the documentary side, you can access 150,000 and that's a grant. Uh, and um, you can make the film for 150,000 you and and use that grant or if you're you know have some some access to other funding uh, you can the, the top budget suggested there is 500,000 um, but we usually you know for those emerging this is the first time filmmaker program we usually suggest think about in the case of a documentary the 150 you've got and what you could achieve on that you get extra money, that's great. Um, so that program is uh, available to first time feature filmmakers. The prerequisite for it is that you had to have had a short um, in, a, in a festival that, that you have made. Um, and the applicants, we look at teams for this program. So it's writer, director, producer who are coming into us. Um, and we fund, I think the last time we ran the program, uh, we funded 18 projects overall. That's French, English, and Indigenous stream. That included some documentaries. Um, and I just, because we're talking to emerging filmmakers, uh, I have a look at the, the new guidelines because there is some expanded eligibility here. So that this used to be entirely a partner-based um, program where you would come in uh, being nominated from the CFC if you were at the CFC or if you were in a training program at VIF or um, the NSI um, or NASCAD, they would nominate uh, people to come in and apply to the program now we've opened it up, there's an underrepresented stream so that if you self-identify as a uh, black or person of color, LGBTQ2+, uh, women, uh, women and non-binary applicants, uh, persons with disabilities, official language minority communities, there will be an apply direct uh, stream 
for uh, applicants who self-identify as, as underrepresented. Um, and this is kind of a bridge year that we're doing to expand the, the eligibility and to get more applicants in. Um, so I won't go into all the details about that, but that is a very interesting um, uh, avenue for getting a first feature done, narrative or documentary. The last thing I wanna go over is there is sort of the bigger budget uh, stream of financing, which is the theatrical doc fund. So that for that, you need a, a, a Canadian distributor attached. To, uh, to trigger the application. Uh, there are lots of distributors who are eligible to trigger that application, but that's part of it. Um, and there, again, that program is gonna be opening again in the spring of next year. And there might be some guideline changes, but right now you can access $150,000 if you're successful. Um, and it accepts production applications or post-production applications. If you've got a film that that has reached a rough cut stage, uh, you can come in and access up to $75,000 for, for post-production if you're successful. So I've prattled on a bit, but those are, I just wanted to give sort of a, a, an outline of the, the programs where you could access uh, documentary funding at Telefilm. Okay, that's helpful. Um, um, what about fiction though? Because there are there are doc makers that are also interested in fiction or that do both. So in, in the realm of fiction, talent to watch, um, you can apply as a first time filmmaker there as I just outlined. Um, and then there are the programs, what we call the regional program and the national program. So regional, those are, uh, that's the low budget uh, end of the, the, the funding uh, for, for fiction. Um, and that would include, again, there's gonna be new guidelines out for this. And right now, uh, it looks like it's going to be anything 3.5 million and below uh, qualifies as a regional or low budget project. And uh, the low end of the ask or the low end of the budget range there, it's from 250,000 to 3.5 million. So for those, um, again, new guidelines coming out soon, but you'll see you can access a certain amount of money for either production or post-production. Um, again, if you've got a narrative feature that you got to a rough cut, you can apply for post-production on that. Then there is the national level. Um, and by the way, that regional level open to first time filmmakers. Again, if you've got a short under your belt, um, talent to watch is not the only way to be a first time filmmaker. You can come through the regional level if you've got a substantial, you know, financing plan that that can um, where you can get a, a movie done at that budget level. At the national level, above three point five million, uh, there you need to show some market interest. Uh, you do need a distributor attached, and uh, those projects are looked at in in terms of. We always look at the creative and the track record, very importantly, there's a little more emphasis on the viability of the project. On if it's above 3.5 million, is this closable? Um, and do you have that market interest? It's often you know, a distributor, broadcaster, international sales, uh, maybe there's some cast attached. Um, so those are the elements we look at when it's a bigger budget movie. And again, this is interesting that First time filmmakers we have funded at the, at the national level. Um, and it just, it's, it's all about whether you can pull together that financing. So, so those are basically the, the, the avenues for feature film funding. Okay, thanks James. Uh, is there a development fund for feature? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, the development fund is a catch-all. Like it, our development fund uh, takes in, it's, it's for everything, low budget, high budget, whatever you're planning to do, and documentary or fiction, it's all under the umbrella of, of our uh, development fund. And that's the 25,000, that is equity. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, Julian, who's in an airport on his way to Cairo. Hi, Julian. Hi, Liz. Uh, 
forgive the mask. Uh, yes, clearly there are extenuating circumstances. Um, I'm actually just about to travel to represent the, the hot dogs funds uh, and specifically our international facing funds. But I think for, for today's conversation, I'm happy to talk about our uh, Canadian focus funds. Perfect. So uh, for the hot dogs funds, can you just give us an overview of the various funds that people can apply for now? And sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, there are two key funds, I would say, um, are that are most applicable to our audience. And those are the Cross Currents Canada Doc Fund and the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Fund. Um, we do also have a new uh, Canadian fund uh, that focuses on music docs, uh, which is is great, and I encourage you to check it out. But I feel like for today's conversation, I'll stick to uh, cross currents and uh, and Ted Rogers. Also, apologies if those announcements are very audible. Uh, <laughs> what can you do? A little loud. Okay, I'll uh, I'll maybe just pause so that I'm not drowned out. All right. Uh, so yeah, so I'll start with the, the Cross Currents Canada Doc Fund, which is really geared towards uh, emerging filmmakers, and in particular, emerging filmmakers from uh, specific priority communities. So it's really open to uh, filmmakers who are Indigenous, Francophone, uh, Deaf, filmmakers who have a disability, uh, or filmmakers who are racialized uh, or persons of color. And through the Cross Currents Canada uh, Doc Fund, uh, you can apply either for a development grant or a production grant. Um, and you can apply for grants for both uh, feature and short form projects. So we have a development grant available for feature projects and a development grant available for short form projects, as well as production grants that are available for features and shorts. Um, for development of a feature, you can apply for up to $30,000 in support. Uh, and for production of a feature, you can apply for up to $50,000. And for the short form streams, uh, you can apply for uh, up to $10,000 in development funding, which can cover your entire development budget. That's actually the case for both of our development streams. They can cover the entire development budget. And then for um, the production uh, grant for the short stream, you can apply up to uh, $30,000 in funding. Um, on the Hot Docs Ted Rogers side, uh, this is a fund that is not specifically geared towards emerging filmmakers, but there are ways in which emerging filmmakers can access it. Uh, this is actually a fund that is aimed at producers. So if you are a uh, emerging filmmaker and you're able to partner with a producer who has at least one prior professional credit, uh, then you would be able to access the Hot Docs Ted Rogers Fund. And the, the, the one other sort of key element of the Ted Rogers Fund is that you need to have a market partner attached in order to apply. So that means uh, a distributor, um, a broadcaster, or a streaming platform partner. And the Ted Rogers Fund grants, um, production fund grants of up to $20,000. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to elaborate or go into detail, um, but I can also maybe share in the chat for anybody that's, that's curious as to what you'll find on our uh, application forms. We actually have a, um, a, a document that lays out all of the information you'll be required to submit. Um, so I'll share that. And then I'll just say in terms of the windows in which to apply, um, the Cross Currents Canada uh, Fund will open again next spring and likely um, our deadline is probably gonna fall in early June and the Ted Rogers Fund um, will open again next summer and the deadline is likely to fall in late July. Okay, there is a question in the Q&A. Um, you may have just answered this. Are the hot dogs funds available all year or just around the festival? Can you maybe just talk about that again around the timing of things? Yeah, sure. So, so the, um, the timing of the funds actually is completely separate from the festival. Um, we do have uh, sort of one call a year for both funds, uh, but the times are slightly different. So again, the Cross Currents uh, Fund opens in the spring um, and then closes in early June. And uh, Ted Rogers opens in the summer and closes in late July. The best way to stay on top of, uh, of those deadlines is actually to 
sign up to the Hot Docs Industry eBulletin if you want to make sure you don't miss those announcements. We haven't actually confirmed the specific dates for 2022 as yet, but that's where they've tended to fall in the past. So I've just shared a link to our eBulletin sign up, and you can specifically sign up to our industry eBulletin, and that way you'll be notified uh, when our funding rounds open again. Okay, thanks. I think um, also, can you talk a little bit about the distribution rendezvous um, that you manage? Because, sure, yeah. You know, sometimes that's how, you know, you complete um, some financing or at least, you know, make the connections to get your film out into the world uh, once it's done. So that's, that's if you could address that, but also could you, um, could you also answer the question, you know, if you receive one of the hot docs funds, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that your film will screen at hot docs. I think sometimes there's, um, uh, you know, an assumption around whether or not that means that hot docs will support your film, you know, at the festival as well. So if you could sure. talk about that. Yeah, um, uh, firstly, um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about um, the, uh, the, the distribution rendezvous program, uh, which Liz, as you mentioned, I oversee. So that's a one-on-one -on -one networking program that pairs uh, filmmakers with projects at the rough cut stage or newly completed projects. It pairs them with sales agents and distributors. So um, you have an opportunity to, uh, if you're participating in the program, uh, see which distributors and sales agents are taking part and then request meetings with them. They can then review uh, your project information. They can look at your visual material, your treatment. And if they think that your project could be a fit for their uh, catalogs, then they will go ahead and accept your meeting request. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like speed dating. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially it's, it's a way to start conversations with potential sales and distribution partners uh, when you are nearing the completion or have newly completed a project. And that does take place uh, during the Hot Docs industry conference each year. Um, but you're, you're quite right, Liz, to uh, distinguish between the Hot Docs industry programs and funds and the, the Hot Docs festival and its programming. They very much op operate in sort of a church and state fashion. So um, we, you know, we share with our programming team um, sometimes some, some, you know, recommendations or we sort of draw their attention to projects that we may have supported through the funds, but we have no influence or insight into their selection process. Uh, so sometimes films that we fund do uh, get selected for the festival, which is always lovely, but, but sometimes they don't. And, and that's really sort of beyond, uh, beyond our control, but, um, but uh, we like to keep it independent. And I think in general, uh, actually hot dogs may be, um, offers more opportunities to filmmakers than, than some realize, because in addition to that public festival uh, every spring, there is the, the forum, uh, if you're looking for international financing, Dealmaker, which is a one-on-one -on -one program similar to, um, to Rendezvous, but for projects that are in development or production and that are looking for uh, international co-financing partners. So um, if you're not familiar with the, the sort of breadth of our industry offerings, I would suggest uh, going to our website, there's a whole industry tab. Again, I could share the link and, um, and you can see uh, what's available to you um, beyond the festival because there are mentorship programs as well, uh, specifically for Canadian filmmakers that will actually pair you with a seasoned um, filmmaker, producer, and, uh, and actually pay you to, to, to undergo mentorship with that filmmaker. So uh, there's there's probably more than, you know, again, I'm aware of uh, we only have a, a limited time of this conversation, so I don't want to uh, yeah. overwhelm with details, but uh, on the website, it's, it's all there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, all right, let's talk about, there's some questions coming in. Also, just um, a reminder, if the panelists are going to post anything in the chat, just make sure it's for everyone. Um, and let's just answer questions, let's just address questions on the fly here. Uh, there's a question for Telefilm. Um, are you offering any kind of coaching for new filmmakers wanting to apply to help them navigate the process? Uh, great question. 
So, uh, especially when I'm talking about the Talent to Watch uh, program, um, and we have this new uh, underrepresented stream that is Apply Direct. Uh, previously, when they come through partners, those those partners like you know the CFC or NSI are sort of coaching their their applicants on on how to put together their package, what they're going to need. Um, so, for this this new stream, we're going to be having a webinar that that will be kind of a, a coaching opportunity about preparing that application, about coming in with best foot forward um, as a as a first time filmmaker, specifically to talent to watch and to that underrepresented stream. In terms of when you're triggered for financing at the talent to watch phase, we're developing a, a long-term mentorship program. Well, the NSI and Innis in, in Quebec are, are developing these mentorship programs, which we're financing and supporting, uh, which will help those first-time filmmakers through the process of if completing their financing, doing contracts, you know, getting to the, the starting blocks and through production, through post-production, so that they'll have sort of a consistent mentorship partner there and, and a program that, that they'll be able to access that will give them that good advice and that will give them a funded uh, mentor uh, on their project. So that's in the works right now. And for those projects that, that are triggered next year, they'll, they'll have that. We used to have a boot camp. We found that you know the one day boot camp really isn't enough. Um, so it's gonna be a, a bigger program. Perfect. Let's talk about content and story. You know, um, what is it that when you're looking at all the submissions that are coming in, you know, all the talent across this country, what catches your eye? I mean, you know, we're sitting here with people that are making these decisions and how, let's start with you, Leslie. What is it that, you know, um, that you're looking for and that stands off the page, so to speak, mm. for you? I know it's so hard, but I mean, for me, often it's big characters, you know, larger than life characters, uh, just people that I, you know, everybody has a great story, but who's going to really grab me um, when I'm watching this either on television or more likely on CBC Gem for the, for the short form content that we're commissioning, um, you know, those big characters, um, you know, something that really feels like it has a great hook. I tend to prefer stories that are active and unfolding. So like we're really on a journey as opposed to um, profiles. Um, those, you know, certainly there's some exceptions and some of those can be fantastic, but I would say generally, and I think Sing Me a Lullaby is, is a good example. Another great example that has done really well for us was Finding Fuque by Daniel Rohr, um, where there's really like right from the get go, what's going to happen? Oh my gosh, you know, is she going to find her long lost friend? Um, you know, so so really um, keeping her attention right right to the end, which is so hard. I totally get that. Um, you know, things um, that will provoke some conversation, especially in the digital space. Um, I wanna, I, I, I always think like, would I share this with my friends on, you know, Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is? Like, am I going to wanna, are people gonna wanna talk about this the way that they're talking about Squid Game? unlikely that they will, that it will have that impact, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, you want to get people talking, um, you know, certainly um, diversity on camera and behind the camera is always, always top of mind. Uh, it's really important for us to be uh, shedding light on stories about and by uh, marginalized communities. Um, and, um, you know, for me, I want, I do, like, it's, it is about emotion. I want to laugh. I want to cry. Ideally, both in the same doc. That's my favorite kind of doc. Um, so, yeah, you might not have all those things right off the bat, but, but you know, just, just uh, something that grabs us. Okay, so character driven. Yeah. And, you know, sort of inherent cliffhangers based on a uh, an unfolding active storyline that yeah. 
that's essentially the, is that, would you say that's the format? That's what you're really looking ideally, for? Ideally, that's, I, I would say okay. ideally. Um, and I think that would be true, not just for our short doc strand, but often for our Passionate Eye episodes and documentary channel. Uh, again, there might be some exceptions here and there. And, and you know, there certainly are some um, stories where we're looking more to the past. Um, but um, but yeah, those, those tend to be the ones that really resonate. Okay, and what about nature of things? That That's different. It's a bit different, but you know, it still has to be entertaining, right? So I think, you know, the storytelling in nature of things is just as important as the science. Um, and when you look at some of the examples that are on that independent producers page, um, I think that, that they help you, uh, they help to illustrate that. I know that some of the, some recent examples that did really well were Dinosaur Cold Case, which has like a really fun CSI approach, um, Bee's Diary, where the whole thing is narrated from the point of view of the bee, um, COVID Cruise um, and was, you know, not, not, um, a really out there approach, but I think was uh, um, told in a, in a really good modern creative way. Um, Takaya, the lone wolf, um, you know, those are just some examples. So, you know, you, it, it can't be dry, um, you know, it's not just about getting information across, it's about inspiring people and, um, you know, I think really enhancing our, understanding of the science of everyday life. Um, I've got one coming up about um, kind of like everyday science in the food that you make and how can you use science to make spectacular mashed potatoes. Um, you know, so I think that you, you really truly do have to be thinking about story just as much as the science, but the science is super important and you got to get it right. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that that's, um, those are certainly projects where, you know, they're, they're more um, journalistically intricate. Um, so you have to, you know, we'll often, in fact, you know, in almost every case, I would say, you know, do at least one phase of development with you um, to really ensure this, everything is there, the story is there, the science is there. Okay, thanks, Leslie. James, there's a question that's come in um, about whether experimental documentaries um, are ever supported. Uh, and, if yes. you could just, and also just expand your answer to talk about what, what it is that, you know, pops off the page for you. For sure, for sure. So, you know, experimental documentaries, um, it, you know, that's an interesting, there's a spectrum of, of uh, uh, docs that could come under that. Uh, it's interesting. We've seen some really interesting hybrids of narrative and doc that have come in that we are happy to, to support um, and that are uh, very expressionistic or, or experimental. Um, or pushing the boundaries of the form um, in, in a lot of different ways. It's interesting, we see those uh, talent to watch documentaries. Often those come in with, you know, sort of inspired filmmakers who wanna do something different. We see that there, but we also see it in the theatrical doc fund um, from time to time uh, that we will do those, you know, very uh, idiosyncratic documentaries along with ones that are, more for a broader audience and, and more conventional. Um, and to, to go into, you know, like decision-making and what we're looking for in projects, um, we've just been through a round of decision-making on docs, on features at every budget level and doing it with, with committees. The, the thing we talk about most is the script or the proposal. Um, and a lot of the, conversation, you know, we're about filmmakers. So that director's vision is so important. Uh, not just the script, but bringing it to life and, and use that director's vision uh, to flex your muscles and, and show how you're going to, you know, make deliberate choices in every realm of your project from, you know, directing the performances to your frame composition to music, to everything. Um, so I would say, you know, lean into that. 
the other thing that we talk about a lot is, is kind of cultural relevance. And is this something that's unique? Is this something that's of the moment? Um, are people dying to see this? Does this speak to the world we live in? Um, that's often a, a, a topic of conversation. And, you know, it's have we, the, the conversation of have we seen this before? Is this retreading something? Is this, you know, speaking to today's audience? So that, that's, that, that comes into our conversations uh, quite a bit. Great, thanks, James. Um, when you talk about that director's vision, let's, let's go deeper into that for a moment. Um, I'm sure there's lots of directors, mostly directors that are listening here today. And let's talk about what is that document from the director what does it look like? And, and talk again about the significance of that document. Well, um, so th you'll be submitting your past works as well. So whether that's short films, features, uh, we look at those to, to look at, you know, um, the directorial approach, um, what the scope of, of those films have been and what, what, uh, what you've accomplished before, what your, your style and sensibility is. So the director's vision, there are so many ways of doing that. I've seen director's visions that are 60 pages long, that have tons of visual references that go into depth on every aspect. And it's so it's an opportunity to uh, express your passion for the project. Like, I have to make this movie. I'm the precisely right person to make this movie. This is what it, and th again, that personal connection uh, it's, it's not nothing to us. We take that very seriously. It's not just about market interest and, and funding a film, but I have to make this film, you know? Um, and those films that are kind of constructed and engineered, um, those can do fine in the marketplace, but we want the ones that are inspired by a sensibility and a vision. So yeah, the director's vision can look in, in so many different ways, but I would just say, express yourself within it. You can do a mood reel, do, you know, put together um, something that, that really shows us uh, what this is going to be. Explain a little bit what you mean by a mood reel. So that can be uh, a collection of uh, clips, images that uh, are from elsewhere that speak to your film and that say, it is this kind of film. Um, or it can be from your own work. And basically it's just, it's, it's not telling the story or it's not a proof of concept, but it's saying, uh, you know, we will create these kinds of feelings, these kinds of images. So if you're referencing other films um, or other, other images, this is what it's gonna look at like and feel like. That's basically what it's getting across. Thank you. Jill, let's talk about content with you. Sure. I should have mentioned at the beginning that, you know, we fund four different types of um, genre. We fund documentaries, which can be one-off docs. We can fund doc series. We can fund um, drama, which is basically anything scripted, uh, comedy, you know, um, you know, uh, one hour TV series, half hours, whatever. Um, and children's and youth programming and variety and performing arts. So those are the four things that we cover. Um, we're, we fund over 2000 projects a year. So we're really looking for great stories at the heart of it. We have a bunch of selective programs where we work with um, international juries and they help us pick these projects. Um, but I would say it's kind of all over the place. We and we see, like, like James, we see lots of different budgets. We see, um, you know, very, very, you know, small, maybe even around 100,000 up to many, many in the millions. Um, but I think it's always about the story. And um, we're also looking for projects that can travel, you know, not just telling the Canadian story, but that, it, you know, internationally people would be interested in. Um, and it's interesting, we, for our POV program, we also have a director's vision, which we, um, take very seriously and it you know helps us form an opinion on the on the project and we also introduced last year producer statements for a couple of our programs for indigenous and for what we call pprc which is the pilot program for racialized communities we introduced this producer statement 
with four questions, uh, uh, basically asking the producer to tell us why they're the ones to tell the story, um, you know, what they bring to it, um, why it's only them who could, could who could tell it, what communities they're going to be working with, how they're going to work in a really respectful way, etc. And it was really, it was really helpful for us to um, to sort of make us focus on on which projects um, just felt more authentic, I suppose. Okay, let's address. Uh, we we have time. I mean, we'll go. I have one more question for you, Jill, and then over to Julian. And then if there's one more question from the audience before we wrap up. So um, obviously there's um, a lot of diversity uh, within our talent pool across Canada, but there's also um, a lot of diverse content. So diverse, um, you know, in terms of ideas, but also diversity of characters and identity and and uh, storylines. How, uh, how do you address, um, you know, let's say it's a predominantly Caucasian team that's presenting a great idea about diverse identities. How do you, what is, how do you look at that? Well, yeah, and that's depending on the program. Um, well, not really, but for the, the two programs that have the producer statement that really that really helped define those lines um, because I think the, if it, it was, you know, uh, all Caucasian um, uh, producing, you know, writer, director, trying to tell a story about uh, some diverse community, I think they would have to stop and think why they are the ones telling, they're the right ones to tell the story. So it was interesting to read their perspective. But um, I mean, we, you know this the same we have um we have markers in place like for different programs for indigenous you know the 51 percent uh the applicant has to 51 percent of the uh, owning the applicant company has to be indigenous you know we're not we're looking to fund indigenous people in this program for racialized it was the same 51 percent so um it helps it, it helps focus those stories. Um, but um, I'm not, uh, I'm mostly in, in the selective funds. So I don't know whether those sort of, that sort of programming is coming through the regular envelope program or not. So I don't know how to, if they're seeing that. Okay, thank you. Julian, what in these, so when you're looking at, and when the juries are looking at the, um, you know, the applications, submissions that are coming into the funds at Hot Docs, what is it that is popping for you? Um, maybe I'll, <laughs> of course, right on cue. Um, I'll, I'll just say that for the Ted Rogers Fund, uh, I think Leslie's input is really um, Quite applicable because that fund we do require a uh, can't hear you <laughs> it's all right okay. yeah and i'm back yeah i was just going to say that for the ted rogers fund um i really echo much of what uh leslie said because for that fund we do require a um, market partner, as I mentioned, which is often a broadcaster. So a lot of the projects that we're seeing apply to the fund have already had support from broadcasters. So much of what Leslie said about, you know, what, what she's looking for coming from the CBC's point of view is applicable to the Ted Rogers Fund. I think the Cross Currents Fund is maybe um, what I can speak to in, in this question that is a little bit maybe less um, straightforward in that uh, I think uh, new visions, new perspectives, both in terms of who is telling the story. Have we have we heard from filmmakers in these communities before? And also new perspectives in the sense of um, experimenting with the form, um, you know, trying new ideas visually, um, really looking for uh, uh, yeah a director's vision. I think, although uh, I said before that the funds and the programming are sort of church and state at Hot Docs, I think we still come at projects from the, the, the point of view of a festival. And generally the festival circuit is where you see filmmakers uh, really sort of expanding the form. It's a, it's a space to uh, celebrate and uplift uh, new, new ways of storytelling, 
uh, new kinds of storytellers. Uh, so I think that that is certainly something that, that we look for. Um, James's point about cultural relevance as well is, is I think, hugely pertinent to us uh, also. Um, that really is something that we, we look for. Um, and to your point, uh, or to your, your, your question just prior, Liz, um, that question of um, who is telling the story, why are they telling the story, uh, what does their team look like? We actually have questions on our application forms that invite applicants to talk about their relationship to the community that they are telling a story about. Um, so there's not necessarily one set way of doing things. I think where um, Indigenous stories are concerned, we, we do really look to see if a project is following the, the protocols and pathways uh, that have been developed. Um, but um, but we invite you to, to to elaborate on your relationship, and it's not that there's sort of one size fits all, but um, but uh, yeah, we, we you know we certainly are attentive to that. Okay, good. I, I hope this is uh, really helpful. I I I think it's very informative. I mean, um, for those uh, people in attendance please look at the chat function, all the, all the uh, links to these um, pages that um, define the criteria, the submission process, pitching, um, all of that is, is uh, on, on those pages. And there's another question that's come in. Sorry, I'm just gonna quickly note, the last link that I put in is to a list of recent recipients of the Cross Currents Fund, both the Canadian and the international strands. So again, if you want to get a sense of the sort of sensibility of the projects, they're, they're certainly varied, but, but nonetheless, that'll give you a very concrete idea of, okay, here are some projects that have received funding in the past, so I have some sense of what they might be looking for. Okay, great. So the last question is about co-productions um, and who can address that on on the panel jill perfect great we um uh i think uh telefilm um has a co-pro office and i think we have 60 treaties something like that james so um we um fund a lot of um fund a lot of co-pros um obviously in the french market with france and of course uh, in the English market with lots of different other countries. Uh, we, uh, if you enter, if you get, um, you know, your co-pro um, status from Telefilm, uh, we um, cover the Canadian costs. We look at the, the overall budget, but we only relate to the Canadian costs. But it, working with a, say you're working with Australia, your country's, the, that country becomes interchangeable. So if you're, you know, writer or director or, uh, anyone else on the team is from Australia, it's, we consider it, um, we don't have any quotas that you have to have with so many Canadians, we just consider the two countries uh, interchangeable. So um, yes, many, many co-productions in, in doc and, in, and in, uh, in television. And we also fund, not a lot of people know this, but you can also fund feature films through the Canada Media Fund. So Jane, uh, many times, um, you know, we will fund um, documentaries as well as um, as fiction uh, features, and um, of course, this is getting boring by now. But you need a broadcast license. Uh, we're almost done. I I will pose a question for the group, which is, um, you know, for the emerging filmmaker directors that are listening and that you know are really seeking needing a producer um, that believes in their vision wants to help them get their first project off the ground what do you recommend i i had a woman call me yesterday and it happens often where you know um because i love to mentor um emerging filmmakers um but they often really need that producer to help them uh, get get their project off the ground. Leslie, you're nodding. Do you want to answer that? Uh, I mean, I think, I, you know, it's tougher these days, you know, maybe not being able to meet as many people in person, but doing as um, many events, you know, joining organizations like the Doc Institute and, you know, all the different amazing events that 
festivals like this and hot dogs do, you know, like just, just getting to know more people and getting a sense of, you know, other people who complement your skill set can be really great. Um, and, you know, also I, I do sometimes just suggest, you know, look at uh, look at some other docs that kind of are, feel like they're in that same space that, you know, I really like that one that I see on CBC Gem. I'm going to look at the credits and see who did that. You know, I, I think certainly reaching out to people that way, but, um, uh, you know, again, like, you know, I don't think at least with CBC, you don't have to have that all sorted before you pitch to us. It can also be a conversation, um, you know, where, where we might either suggest, uh, you know, some people or again, like some, some films to take a look at, um, you know, I would never be prescriptive about you must work with this person. Cause also it's the relationship that's so important, but, um, but, you know, I think just, just talking it through with some other people and, um, not putting pressure on yourself to have it all sorted out uh, right from the get-go. Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, and back to Alessandra. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Liz. Thank you all so much. That was a fantastically informative panel. I hope all the filmmakers enjoyed. Uh, thank you so much to Leslie, Jill, James, Julian, lots of J's, um, and of course, Liz. The recorded version of this will be available on CineSend for the run of the festival and on our YouTube channel at Planet in Focus after that. We hope you enjoyed today's session and we'll see you online at watch.planetinfocus.org from October 14th to the 24th. Thank you all again and take care. Bye. Safe travels, Julian. Thank you. Thanks all. Yeah, safe, safe travels.